Xbox Game Pass has become a pillar in Microsoft's success during this generation. Since 2017, the subscription service offered access to hundreds of games for gamers that maybe don't have the exposure to try an enriched gaming library. It's a fantastic opportunity to try the titles you never even thought of buying in the first place, and of course, the best place to play Xbox first-party exclusives. With more than 120 million active monthly subscribers, it's safe to say the subscription model is tailored for everybody, from console gamers, PC, and even cloud gamers all over the globe. However, some concerns were raised over the years that are questioning the philosophy of this model. In this day and age, subscription models are becoming a hassle to maintain with too much content to watch on lesser quality overall. Some video games have been released in a less desirable state, and studios seem to be more inclined to have creative choices that might be subject to debate. With all that in mind, does Xbox Game Pass really affect the quality of their video games? Of course not! It's still a win for everybody! Well, almost. I'm Leo S. Luna, former reviewer and now video producer, and after years of using this service, I am here to give my opinion. As I deep dive into my thoughts, let's take a look at how this service works and how the company handles it with studios. Especially now that we learned a lot from the past interviews with Phil Spencer and Matt Booty in the recent weeks, and of course the excellent Xbox Showcase, Starfield Direct, and extended presentations. Similar to Netflix, Xbox Game Pass gives you access to a ton of video games in exchange for a subscription fee. From first party exclusives of their first lineup to the most recent studio acquisitions, up to third party outlets. Some of them are all games and others are day one releases. You could even add online features and EA Play video games with the ultimate tier. You can download anything from the catalog and play it locally without any loss of quality whatsoever. I can talk more about this model, but I'll leave it for a further Xbox buying guide video. Up to this point, I don't think there's any loss for gamers, right? So, one of the discourses around the internet is the idea that Microsoft has been negligent with their first-party studios, letting video games released in a less desirable state like Redfall or earlier versions of Sea of Thieves, State of Decay 2, and Halo Infinite back in the day to allegedly populate the Game Pass catalog regardless. There's also an idea that because a video game is included in Xbox Game Pass, developers are having an extra caution and zero pressure when it comes to delivering a quality game. You've seen this in Netflix, where it produces multiple shows and movies solely based on the creative minds behind the studios without worrying too much about the risks behind it. Well, that is what most people think. In fact, most companies do really take care of their first-party ecosystem, but that doesn't mean everyone is on par with the subscription model. Even PlayStation has been vocal against it. The company commits to releasing first-party exclusives on full price without the need to include them on day one via PlayStation Plus. And you see, here's when things get complicated to understand for the players. It's very difficult to maintain this model nowadays without having some loss in the process. Your so-called AAA games with pretty ultra-realistic and expansive gameplay do cost a lot of money, time and sacrifices. PlayStation is no stranger to survive losses. I'm very proud to announce that PlayStation 4 will be available at $399. It is believed that the PlayStation 4 was cut to 400 US dollars only to gain strength in the past generation and win over Microsoft. It may have issues to invite more players to join the PlayStation 5 club, but that's another topic of discussion. What's important here is that not every company is ready to survive by simply investing in marketing and selling your game at full price. Over the past 10 years, there have been dozens if not hundreds of companies that either have been shut down due to high costs and low demand or were purchased by billion companies like Sony or trillion companies like Microsoft. 
So here's when Xbox Game Pass comes into play to help maintain the balance of the risk. Past interviews with Phil Spencer and Matt Booty have let us explain how the services work in favor of developers. And kudos to them for explaining everything on a grounded level, because up to this day, there are many things we don't know from companies like Nintendo, EA, or Activision other than corporate stuff and higher tier workers. And here we have a CEO casually chatting about it. And I know you're thinking about Redfall and Starfield at 30 FPS. We'll get into that. So here's how it goes. 23 of the first party studios and the possibility to be 33 in total with the Activision Blizzard acquisition have a fixed salary that will give them stability and even a creative freedom of the games they're developing. They don't have to appeal to a safe genre and can create innovative titles in the process like Pentiment or Hi-Fi Rush. Games like Sea of Thieves and State of Decay 2 may have had a rough start, but are so much better nowadays thanks to the immense amount of updates released. Even a game like Redfall has recently received an important patch that addresses some of the issues. You can't even tell how creative and different most of the titles shown in the Xbox Showcase are. Microsoft seems to not involve too much with the developing process. The company is just there to make sure every studio has the tools to finish their games and mitigate when some of them are not ready yet. Starfield is the best example, a game that was allegedly ready to release but was heavily improved by waves of QA tests and development cycles, all because Bethesda reached out to Microsoft and provided assistance in no time. It apparently is the game with the fewer bugs in Bethesda's history. Matt Booty has even mentioned that some games like Fable had some incredible features he wanted to show, but the studio eventually decided to hold back for future shows. At some occasions, they send other studios to help, like in the case of The Coalition assisting Arcane Austin. In regards to Redfall, Phil Spencer had accepted that the Xbox team was not present enough to assist, but that could have been an issue dragged on even before the acquisition. Now, I'm not justifying Xbox here, I'm just echoing what we know so far. It is said from a Bloomberg report that due to Arkane Austin's commercial failure of past games like Prey, Bethesda and Arkane decided to push a live service game with microtransactions with the critically acclaimed mechanics of their most beloved franchise, Dishonored. And due to that, a lot of Arkane artists and devs left the company because they simply didn't want to develop a multiplayer game ended with just 30% of the team that worked on Prey. Keep in mind that all of this happened just right before the acquisition of Bethesda. That idea was changed over time to a simpler PvE story campaign. After the acquisition of Bethesda, Bethesda itself was still the one in charge of logistics and production, similar to how LinkedIn was purchased by Microsoft while running independently. Phil Spencer had even stated that Xbox Game Studios spent more time with Starfield than Redfall. I know it's a bit confusing, but my reading here is that of all the studios Xbox was taking care of, only a few were affected by the acquisition, so I personally don't think Xbox Game Pass was the main reason for the poor choices taken here. However, they should address this in a better way, like expanding their quality assurance at Xbox Game Studios, for instance, and having multiple demos and screen reviews of each exclusive title. Whatever the case, it is in Xbox Game Pass' fault, and in fact, I would honestly say that without Microsoft or Game Pass, Arkane Austin would have been shut down, and now thanks to this stability floor, maybe we could see a new game, a new Dishonor or Praise sequel from them. And if you were one of those devs that left Arcane, please go back or at least point out in the comments as to how your experience was back then. We have the case of Grounded, a PvE game a la Honey I Shrunk the Kids that started as an early access game and found success with its community and eventually launched as a complete game early this year. Games like Sea of Thieves, Microsoft Flight Simulator, and State of Decay 2 have extended their services thanks to Game Pass, whereas you see third-party titles like Knockout City and Rumbleverse are shutting down after barely one year of release. 
What I mean is that the service helps multiplayer games to ease their cycles, letting studios work on them without overtime work and risks. And there's also the case of Halo Infinite and their ups and downs with the season pass and the campaign that were mitigated by the service too. Again, I'm not justifying the poor choices taken in the past, but I'm noticing a trend of the Redman company to carry on with their studios for years until they came out with something good. Just like what happened to Sea of Thieves. Phil Spencer has also attributed that PC gaming has indeed helped them a lot. Sales and popularity have been pushed on PC Game Pass and have also helped to sell games on Steam as well. You know, the company is more keen to sell the brand as a service than the consoles itself. They even pushed the cloud service on cloud with Xbox Cloud Gaming via apps on iOS, Android and Samsung TVs. He also acknowledged Microsoft as a less popular brand than even Nintendo and Sony. Obviously, that doesn't mean anything considering Xbox has a trillion dollar cushion, but at least it is a humble way of seeing things in a more grounded level. So yeah, even third party companies are winning with Xbox Game Pass worth by selling outside of the console spectrum. When it comes to third party games, Xbox keeps constant communication with multiple studios and companies that are interested in including their game for a limited time. Xbox pays them a fee, which by the way helps smaller companies to handle the costs of release and it also helps them market their game to other platforms, resulting in much better sales and without the need for investing more in marketing. Xbox seems very comfortable with the companies using Game Pass to boost sales on other platforms. After all, they are winning so much more player base. Plus, studios could even pull some extra money with DLCs and expansions. You could say that the service was like those PlayStation demo discs that helped to expand your knowledge in games. It was confirmed that Xbox Game Pass was the perfect tool to have a better approach with Japanese developers that that, of course, had been a constant demand from Xbox players, even if they had their unique exclusive Japanese games before. So, what the company is doing is approaching companies like Square Enix, Capcom, Sega, Bandai Namco, and many more to market the games, whether it is an old title releasing for the first time on Xbox, an old comeback, or a day one release. It's also worth noting that not every studio has access to Xbox Developer Kit and the language barrier is almost always an issue as well. So Microsoft Japan is probably ensuring this with small and giant studios. I know it because they were expanding their division to assist the developers over there. They also approach events like Bitsumita or Tokyo Game Show as well. Matt even highlighted that yes, AAA games are taking so much time to make, and when he meant a long time, he was talking about half a decade. That's why it is so important to have something in the middle, like the amount of new third-party games that were released in the past 12 months. I personally have been enjoying at least one or two games per month from the catalog, and some of them were goatee material like Vampire Survivors, a Black Tail or Requiem, and Signalis. And the topic of Starfield running at 30 frames per second on consoles, well, that could be an entire video, but all I can say is that the frame rate is still a creative choice respected by Xbox and it doesn't have to be a detriment to the game quality overall. The game clearly has to deal with a lot of objects running in real-time while running real-time lightning over the highly detailed planets of what looks like an expanding open universe. Yeah, it's not even open world, but open universe with a strong, compelling and structured narrative. It's still a creative choice in the same way where Guerrilla Games decided to constantly update things on Horizon Forbidden West by demand of the fans and at their will. They would have left the game without a 60 FPS mode, but it was their choice, which doesn't relate to being negligent with a product and under delivering to fans. It also seems that some people have been feeling a burnout in gaming content, but as Phil said, it all depends on the person's tastes. And then I was like, you oh, gotta try new things. And dude. then I was like, you this is actually pretty cool. I honestly think 
there's enough games to not feel bored or overwhelmed unless you keep playing the same genre over and over again. Probably if people are waiting solely on first party exclusives, then I guess you may feel that way. But it's a personal issue rather than the service itself. For now, of course. Plus, you can't compare the thousands of shows and films on Netflix to just plus 400 titles on Xbox Game Pass. There are a lot, but they're not trying to inundate people. It's just a taste of what players can expect in their service. And finally, Xbox has stated that Xbox Game Pass is the key for a lot of players to play more games. Kind of strange that for less money you have more access and knowledge. Personally, that discourse of purchasing your games versus having a subscription service is having a toll on social media and honestly, it's pretty tiring. But I think people usually forget that number one, we all have different tastes and your favorite game does not have to resonate with the rest of the people. And yes, I do think scores are terrible and don't truly evaluate the games fairly. But most importantly, is to know how different economies and social status are worldwide. Not everybody has the money to get every game at $70, and Xbox Game Pass is the gap for those that can't afford that luxury and the perfect opportunity for new studios to show off their new titles or rebirth some old ones. But again, that's a topic for another day. Overall, it's wild to think that nowadays Microsoft can easily pull off great gaming experiences without depending too much on Halo, Gears of War or Forza, because if you watch that presentation, you can definitely feel there's more to it. As of now, Xbox Game Pass is not hurting the quality of the games and developers may have their own liberty when it comes to developing interesting projects. However, I'm pretty sure Xbox Game Studios needs to reinforce their structure to ensure better quality for each project. I do understand when journalists are questioning Xbox Game Pass next to other subscription models. There's a risk of emphasizing quality over quantity, which to their own right is excellent for artists since they have more opportunities to do their own projects. but. Not every production feels carefully crafted like Stranger Things, for instance. Speaking about Xbox, considering the amount of studios they have, they should consider increasing the size and quality of Xbox Game Studios, so maybe we could avoid undercooked releases, for instance. Xbox is no stranger to this since I remember Scalebound being cancelled and I'm pretty sure they will be addressing that in some way. I personally wouldn't want a fantastic team such as Arcane Austin to feel let down by one miss. It's all steps to success, and they know it pretty well with their solid gaming history. And I guess they were right, games are taking longer to make, and that also means that the Halo Infinite wounds are taking longer to heal and reestablish. And to gamers, there's nothing to worry about, as I always say. There's nothing to lose or demand if you still have a giant backlog behind. I'm Leo S. Luna, and if you liked this video, don't forget to like, leave a comment telling me about your favorite Xbox games and which of the Xbox showcase you're interested to play in the future. Also, let me know if you feel okay with Xbox Game Pass or not. Also share this video to a friend who maybe is cynical with Xbox Game Pass, maybe he could have a change in mind. Remember, I will try to post at least two videos every month, now that we are heading our way to 500 subscribers and more than 5000 watch hours. So for now, take care and I'll see you soon.